This time on Graveyard Cars. Mike Hill and his son Michael are going on a 4,000 mile road trip in their newly restored 1970 Superbird. But not before Mark and the ghouls finish the job. See the complete restoration as they document, tear down, rebuild, paint, assemble, detail, and drive. Taking this legendary NASCAR from broken down beater to bird of prey and see the unprecedented reveal. When the whole Hill family and the original owner see the completed Superbird for the first time on this episode of Graveyard cars. Got that car coming to get you. Bye bye, bye bye, bro. The unburied dead. Coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman, and together with the most critical man in the world, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! My son in law, Josh. Oh, yeah! And my best friend, Roy. Well, all right. We bring dead muscle cars back to life to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. If we don't kill each other. There. Oh. Oh. It's gonna be a bloodbath. The Hills are in the office, it's always stressful. Mike and Jen and Michael and the original owner of the car for the first time, we're gonna roll around the corner and show them this beautifully restored all original EW1 Plymouth Superbird. Last time they saw this car, it was uh, completely rotten from the frame rails up, meaning the body panels, the outer skins. It was uh, in a disarray that was barely even able to recognize that it was a Superbird. Uh, we expect a great reception as long as the car doesn't let us down when we go around the corner. But right now, if all goes well and we continue on the way we are, we should have an amazing reveal. It's going to be a fun Monkey Martin, back. where are you? Mm -hmm. okay. oh, I'm ready to see it. Yes, sir. Turn and hold it. I've got to be back. a long time. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Been a long Look time. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I spent quite a bit of time on the phone with Mike Hill talking about the Superbird. I had a pretty good impression of what I was going to be getting when it showed up. Somebody had stripped it early in its life, maybe back in the mid-70s, and that's what caused all the decay on the outer part of the, the body panels, like the quarters and the doors and the fenders, that kind of stuff. When the Superbird first arrived here at Graveyard Cars, I was happy that it was all intact and it was complete, but once I started looking at it, I seen the overall condition of the car. It was a very poor, it was a very rusty, rough car. But looking around it and like looking underneath it, it looks like the structural part is not in bad shape. Like the inner frame rails, front frame rails, rockers, things like that, it looked like they survived good. That's probably because they didn't get stripped to bare metal and set in a field like the outer part of the car did. I get a lot of phone calls from people all over the country. I get a lot of emails talking about the cars that they have. The compelling part for me on the Superbird was, A, it's a real life uh, Superbird, that it's a real life NASCAR. It's in the registry of 1920 Superbirds that were made. But the story behind it, that this Superbird and the other Superbird that the Hills have sat side by side in this field for all of their lives, practically. These cars, to me, were my ultimate muscle car. Mike had wanted a Superbird from the time he was a little kid. Uh, there was an urban legend in town that a guy had one. Whenever I would pass by this gentleman's house, from the road you could just see the chips of the wings as you were coming by. It was one of those things that where I said, if I ever get a chance, I was going to go over there and see if I could buy these cars. Uh, however, the urban legend also said that the guy that owned the car was a lunatic who would stick his dog on you and kill you if you went up and so much as knocked on the door and asked about him. So Mike never did. We decided to build a Daytona clone. They got quite a ways on the Daytona. They got the rear body panel replaced on it from the 68 to the 69. They changed the side markers out. So we get our parts together on the tail end of the car. Well, when it comes to the front end of the car, I have no idea how to hang this fiberglass nose on it. So I discussed it with a guy that I met at the post office. He's an old gearhead buddy of mine. He said, you know what? He said, why don't you go around to the guy's house and show him that you're actually working on a wing car by taking your parts and you might have a chance of getting a look at his car. And he did just that. He collected the few parts that he had questions about, got his son in the car, and they went over to the guy's house. Sure enough, he met me at the door. He comes out of the door and says, can I help you? I go around to the back of my truck, and I quickly grab the fiberglass nose cone, hold it up to show him, hey, I've, I've got parts here. He says, uh, what can I help you with? After Mike explained to him it was a father-son project that they were working on together, 
I think that softened the blow to the old man, and he says, yeah, if you want to take some pictures, go take some pictures. We get out of the truck, we start heading back to the woods, and as I look back in the woods, I see two Superbird wings, just as plain as day. Here you got the year 2007, and these cars are still in this guy's backyard, undiscovered, unrestored, just sitting there. I guess the guy that owned the cars really took a liking to Michael and to his dad and the idea that they were working on a project together. And uh, I think they began to form a friendship out of that. You know, when we went to the truck, I thanked him for his time. I reached across the dash and I got one of my business cards. And I also got a $10 bill that I had there in the ashtray and I handed them both of them. And I said, hey, I want you to keep this. And he said, well, what's, what's this for? I'm giving you that $10 so you don't throw away my business card because I know these are your children and I know that they're, you know, they're yours and you want to keep them. But if for any reason you ever decide you want to sell them, I know that you know what you have here and I know what you have here. Those cars are very rare and they're worth a lot of money. I'll be willing to give you your price for them. And that's all I said. We didn't talk price. It was just, I'll give you your price for them. So after a few months, out of the blue, Mike gets a phone call from the guy that owns the cars saying, are you still interested in these things? I've considered selling you these cars under two reasons. Number one, you don't take these cars and resell them. He says, because my second condition is, you guys being a father-son team, he says, I want to see you end up with one bird, and I want to see him end up with one bird. Mike made the promise and kept the promise and ended up getting the cars from him. To this day, he and I have become to be really good friends. Uh, he and Michael and I go riding motorcycles together, and uh, we've developed a really good relationship. So it was a really good feeling to come away from all of that, not only with two superbirds, but to know we've made a new friend here and that, that he's going to see his kids come back to life all in all, I'm glad that Mark agreed to restore the Superbird for the Hills because they had such a heartwarming story behind the car, not only about themselves, but with the original owner of the car. You know, stories like Mike's, these are the fabrics that make up our life. At least my life and the generation of the people that I hang out with and that I grew up with. I love that Graveyard Cars can go now and tell these stories and bring to life other people's history and other people's memories. Here's where all the big stuff is. Big stuff. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> this is now going to be part of their lives for the rest of their lives. We've seen the Superbird's arrival and learned of the incredible backstory behind this legendary muscle car. The Hill shared their story and why the car is so important to them. Next, we need to document everything before we disassemble it. Today we're disassembling Mike Hill's 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Uh, the guys won't be here for about an hour, so that'll give me a chance to raise it up in the air, do all of my documentation without being interrupted by them and their foolishness. Uh, there's two things I'm looking for underneath there. One is Lynch Road assembly line procedures and unique procedures for just the Plymouth Superbird. And up here at the front on the K-member, you see an X. It's always nice to really go over these cars with a fine tooth comb, you know, see what exactly what markings and whatnot some of these cars have on them. It's like finding a buried treasure, you dig, 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 and you find a little pot of gold or something. Then later on, when the car is complete, we'll actually duplicate those factory markings that we find and add the ones that are also missing. And that, that X right there let somebody know something on the assembly line, whether it was that the steering gear was in place or whether the, everything had been torqued or checked, that X meant something. Having this knowledge, being able to use this knowledge for my own use is very important. But when somebody calls me up out of the blue and says, dude, I got a Superbird and I got a big X on the cross member on the, on the K-frame, you know what the big X is. I don't actually know, but I can document that mine has it too, but maybe the Superbird down the road didn't have it. Now we can say, well, why would one have an X and one not? We might be able to go back and find options that would have supported why that X was there. Here's where all the big stuff is. Big stuff. See the paint on the inside of that nose cone is running down. That means it was upside down when they painted it. And then here's the rivets. Those are great to know what the exact size of the rivet is. So once we get that nose cone piece off of there, we'll be able to uh, determine what the width and the diameter and the exact length of those are. And that would be the last two digits of the factory part number for the correct K-member for the 1970 Plymouth Superbird. There's been a lot of documentation of all the cars over the years. The Superbird, Roadrunners, Cudas, you know, satellites, GTXs, you name it. There are people dedicated to documenting. Guys like Dave Weiss who have dedicated an entire life and write books about the documentation of these cars. 
But for me, I want my own first-hand knowledge of it. I want my own little database of it. That's the fun part of my job. What's happening, Chief? How you doing? You guys are on time. Right now, we're going to disconnect everything on the top of the engine that's needed so we can drop the engine transmission out one unit attached to the K member, like the radiator hoses, wires, etc. If somebody can take the, we could take that radiator out of there right now if somebody can disconnect the lines on the bottom. You need a 5 eighths and a half inch wrench. It's been pretty cool so far. It's been a handful putting up with Darren. We'll let Derek do that. He hasn't done anything. Get down there, Derek. We're, we're getting through it. We're going to live through it. It's all good. Darren's a narcissistic lunatic. Okay, he goes out and picks on my top guy, Derek, starts beating him up saying, you haven't paid your dues. You haven't been around long enough. You gotta, you gotta be here longer. Who, who are you? Look at me, I'm the great Darren. I'm part of the team and you're not. And then I find out from the camera guys that he's taking a little siesta in the back. Uh, Darren apparently has a headache or he's playing the game, so he's laying down in the office. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, us three guys can rock and roll and get the rest of this car apart. I think the disassembly of the Superbird went just fine. Um, there's always a couple things that hang you up, but all in all, it went good. You know, I was training Derek easy every step of the way. He was getting better as he went on. For as rusted out as this thing is, I can't believe how fast we got the brake line and the gas tank out. And it's all intact. Well, so basically we just finished taking the car apart. Uh, I still have to have the glass guys come out and remove the windshield and the back glass. Derek's got a few more things he has to take off of it, but I wanted to get it moved out of that area. We're on a roll. The 1970 Plymouth Superbird was available from the manufacturer in seven different colors. True or false, two of these colors were actually at no extra charge. The answer coming up after the break. So were two of the seven colors available on the 1970 Plymouth Superbird at no extra charge? The answer is true. The standard color was Alpine White. That meant all the birds were that color unless you ordered otherwise. Another color, B5 Blue Fire, was available at no extra charge. That left Corporate Blue or Petty Blue, Lemon Twist Yellow, Limelight, Tor Red, and Vitamin C if you were willing to spend the extra money. Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. The disassembly on the Hills 1970 Plymouth Superbird went perfectly. The body can now go up to the dipper, the engine can go over to the machine shop, and Darren can go back to sleep. Now we gotta focus on bodywork, panels, and paint. I work very closely with the body men as to what panels need to come off and how I want them taken off, how I want them replaced. And so in the case of the Superbird, I can get together with uh, Derek and Lucky and say, listen, this I need to have off, I need it dissected this way, just gonna put this part of the panel back on or we're just gonna put this section in. What we're working on today is putting a brand new door skin on our 70 Superbird door shell. This is a brand new Auto Metal Direct door skin. This is a replica of the original door skin you would have got from Chrysler. Josh just gave us back the door uh, shell. It was media blasted down to the original bare metal. All the rust was removed. We have it treated on the inside and out. And so he starts it folding over. And then he, once he has it starting to lean, then he can get more aggressive. And he's going to carry that on all the way around the door, full 360, till that skin is married to it like it's supposed to be in the right shape. Then he's going to do his spot welds. At that point, that door will be united with a brand new door skin, an original shell, and we will have saved a good portion of that door. You know, one of the things that happens out here at a shop like ours is we don't have all the equipment the manufacturer had. We can uh, emulate the way it looks when it's finished, but we fit it on there, fit the quarter panel on there, we put it in place, we set a couple of set screws in it, then we do the trunk floor, the trunk floor extensions, kind of mock up all of the sheet metal, get an idea if everything's square, then we start pulling the pieces back off of the outers, leave that one in that we know was good, the trunk floor, and that's where we start welding. Then we can start putting the extensions on it, wheelhouses on it, quarters on it, next thing you know, you built out the car. It's starting to look like a floor now, that big one piece. This again is the new Auto Metal Direct floor. It's a, a exact duplication of the factory one with all the factory provisions, including the drains, the hump for the shifter. Such an improvement over what we've had in the past to, to use on these cars. They look good and they fit good. Of course, they need work afterwards, you know, to get Darren, the you're bogarting really the mic. Nice. Don't bogart the mic. When it comes to one of the single stage colors like our EW1 Alpine White on the Superbird, any of these colors that don't have metallics in them, you can panel paint them. 
That means that you don't have to have all the panels on the car and walk around it at one time and do the paint. You have to with a metallic because metallics fall differently. So in the case of the Superbird, that allows us whatever panels are done first, we can start painting them. Yeah, it's really important to me that the car leaves in just immaculate condition. It's right because it's got my name all over it as well as everyone else here at Graveyard Cars. A little while ago, Derek came and got me. I needed to sign off on the jamming of the deck lid, the doors, and the hood, so I did that. He went ahead and painted those. They came out really nice. We've got them out here now. Now the car is in the booth. I go in there and make sure that all the holes that are supposed to be there are there. All the ones that aren't supposed to be there aren't there. We got our squirter bottles and voltage regulator, all our normals. He doesn't know every hole that's supposed to be there. And back in the 70s when these cars were driven, people add a hole for a tack wire. They add one for an oil pressure wire. And so now's the time to fix it so that you're not going back and spotting in the paint. Actually, what you should do is get a good bolt, go into the Mr. Mopart's room and get the correct bolt and put it in there. And go ahead and put bolts in here to keep these threads clean. But they actually get painted with the battery tray. You could even put the battery tray in it if you had it, but it's so much easier to get paint everywhere right now. But at right. least the fasteners, if you put those in, I would think, you'd be doing it pretty darn right. And they're pure painted and we're good to go. Yeah. You got my blessing, buddy. Right on. See ya. Final top had to be peeled back and the imperfections fixed. Michael, you ready to hit the road? Yes, sir. Our 70 Superbird for Mike Hill is getting really close to paint work on it. So I want to go over it with the guys, go over the body uh, inch by inch. When you're talking about painting a car, doing all the body and the paint work on a car, it, it's a big motion. It's a lot of money in materials. It takes a lot of time to do it. And so if something's wrong, now's the time to find it before you actually do that paint work. So I want you to look at frame rails, floorboards, inner and outer aprons, upper and lower deck filler panels, inside the roof, okay. cow panel, inner cow panel, firewall, outer deck, extension, okay, rear body a, panel, I rear balance, everything. I got a spot. That's Darren's forte, finding something wrong with something. That's what he does. That's his meal you, if you will. I'm good at this. You know, I seem to pick up a lot more imperfections than most people do, but it's a pretty blatant imperfections. I don't know why a lot of people can't see them. You know, you know wavy panels, bolts missing, mismatched, misaligned panels and whatnot. I think actually that's one of my better traits is looking for, you know, doing the QC. So we're good. Um, you actually found a couple things. Darren actually found a couple things that he didn't know about. So, so I mean, eight sets of eyes, 10 sets of eyes, 20 sets of eyes. The more people looking, the better it gets, right? Clients usually want the body and paint to look nice. Mike Hill, I talked to him about this. I said, you know that these were really edgy, not good from the factory. And he goes, I don't want that. I want it to be the nicest body and paint that you can do. I want it to look in that one aspect better than it did at the factory because the factory really missed the mark. They were mass produced cars, but now we can improve on it. I think that we should. So far, we've looked at how the Superbird came to Graveyard Cars, the incredible story of the Hills acquisition of the car, and how much this Superbird means to the father and son team. The car has been disassembled, documented, panels replaced, and or repaired to factory OEM specs. And now that most of the painting is done, we can focus on the most iconic Superbird pieces, the wing and the nose cone. So now that our uh, Superbird is all painted, we're off to the booth to do the uh, wing and the nose cone. The Plymouth Superbird started life as a roadrunner, okay? And so certain conversions were made at a company called Creative Industries. That's who did the nose cone conversion, that's who did the hood conversion, that's who added the wing and did the back window plug. So the car was already painted when it went over there. What they did over there was they tried to match it, but what they used was a lacquer paint. Where the car was painted in enamel, they used a lacquer paint. So all of the time, like on Tony's car, uh, Tony D'Agostino's got a B5 Blue uh, Superbird, and his nose cone doesn't match the rest of the car even close. So with the Superbird, what we try to do is make all of the paint good quality, but tip our hat and make the nose and the wing and the scoops that go on the fenders 
off just a hair. I think to the unknowing person, it, it shows and whatnot, they're gonna say, oh wow, look at the paint, it's a different color on the wing and the nose cone. They don't know, the people that don't know that, I think it's gonna be a bad thing. You're gonna have people at car shows that don't know what they're talking about. You do it the right way, and then if somebody hopefully asks instead of implies, uh, you get an opportunity to educate that particular person. Today, the guys and I are getting ready to marry together the engine transmission, drive shaft, torsion bars, basically the drive train for the 70 Superbird. First, we have to get it moved outside and washed. The compound that we're cleaning off of the Superbird is, uh, is the product that we use when we do our wet sanding and our buffing. When you finish painting a car, it uh, has little imperfections in the paint, has orange peel or texture to it. And what we want to do is we want to wet sand all of that out. So we usually start with like 1,000 grit wet dry paper. You flatten out the paint, you get those impurities out of it, and then you start massaging that out to about 3,000 with sandpaper. So you start with 1,000, you go to 1,500, 2,000, 25, and then 3,000. Then you buff it. It's that compound that you use when you're buffing it that gets stuck in every door jam, in your eyes, all over your clothes, inside the engine compartment, trunk compartment. So what we're doing is removing all of that compound before we come back inside with the car and start doing the polish on it. Reuniting the drivetrain in the Superbird, installing it is no different than if we were working on a Cooter or a Roadrunner or a Charger. We're getting ready to lower the car down onto the motor. They're always a tight fit, but with the shocks on there, it's just something else we gotta watch as it's going together. It's always a pain when they're an RB engine. The 440 is about an inch and a half wider at its widest point than, say, a 383, and considerably wider than a small block LA engine like a 318 or a 340. I got a problem with this manifold and okay. the steering gear. It's almost like the motor's got to roll to get it to fit up in there. There are literally, in some cases, no room at all between the two shock towers, and you have to manipulate the engine just a little bit to walk it past the shock towers. I think you can go to the right is what I was going to say. I think it's going to be inevitable to no. scratch it. It's not inevitable. I just think if this comes over, it'll clear. OK, well, now it's clear. <laughs> That's why I was saying it just needed to come over this way. Um, that's exactly what we'll have to do on the Super Bird. That's what we've had to do on all the cars with the RB engines in them. There's a lot to do in a complete restoration. We can't be experts at everything. That's why we have Larry come do headliners for us. Larry, he's been doing it forever, so he's really good at it. And even him, inside that car, can pull his hair out all day long trying to get a good, tight, drum-type fit on that uh, headliner. So for me, I would rather stick with what I really know, like the body and the paint, and making sure the, the engines are right, and the transmissions are right, making sure that they're dressed out right, making sure the right parts are on it, doing the history, doing all those things. That's why we sub it out. The Superworks take a plug that goes in their rear window opening, and when the vinyl top was put on the car, there was quite a few imperfections around where the plug was put in, so the vinyl top had to be peeled back and the imperfections fixed. We couldn't tell exactly what the shape of that opening is supposed to be. It's a metal plug that goes in, fills up a portion of the upper deck filler panel, smooths out, and drops the back of the top off a little bit slower than the original one did. Get the vinyl top on it, and you can see that the upper edge around it is too sharp. I got hold of Tony D'Agostino. He sent me pictures of his Survivor Superbird, and I can see that that area where ours is a real crisp line needed to be a bullnose line, needed to be a real soft transition. So that meant peel the vinyl top back off, reshape it, primer it, paint it, and roll the vinyl top back down. It sucks, but you have to do it, especially if you're picky about what you do. You don't want to send something like that out. And we'll still get her done as planned, on time to be delivered. So just a few extra hours, a few extra nights a week, no big deal. I'll be in here slaving away, making sure it gets done. It's all about zen. It's, it's woo-saw. You know what I'm saying? Relax. Don't do it. Put your body into it. Famous NASCAR driver Richard Petty made the Plymouth Superbird a household name back in the 70s. What was the number on the side of the King Richard's car? Was it 13, 23, or 43? The answer is coming up after the break. And, uh, and don't go Google or anything. Just you should know this. Mopar. So what was King Richard Petty's number on the side of his Plymouth Superbird? The answer is number 43. Known famously for the STP as one of his sponsors in the 43, the blue, Petty Blue, 
Plymouth Superbird became a household name back in the early 70s. Okay, Google, when did Richard Petty retire? Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. The Superbird is really coming together. The body and paint are beautiful. The rear window plug issue has been addressed along with the vinyl top. Now all that's left are a few decals and this bird is ready to fly. I mean, you know, obviously once we get it running, it'll be ready to fly. Right now we're getting ready to put some pieces and parts on our Superbirds. My guess would be, and I don't have the exact answer, but I would imagine that Creative Industries is the one that applied the large Plymouth decal and the standing Roadrunner bird, because all these were unique to the Superbird. If they weren't, I think the manufacturer would have done it. I think over at Plymouth, they would have probably put them on. Like the back deck lid stripe that goes on a 70 Roadrunner, that was normal on all the Roadrunners that were coated with it. Right now I'm getting ready to do the most difficult part, which is the blackout that goes on the headlight doors and around the headlight doors uh, that's very unique to the Superbird. You know, on the Mopars, it was weird. Some of the stripes were painted on, some of them were decal. On the Superbird, they chose to use the decals on the nose cone. I think that's a way to save time and money. It's always been a mystery to me what made Chrysler decide when they were gonna paint something on. Like on the 70 Roadrunner, you take the V21 hood black out, paint it on. Take a 70 Charger, paint it on. But on a Challenger, the V21 is a big vinyl graphic. So I don't know what makes them decide when they're going to do it and when they're not going to do it. In the case of the Superbird, why not do one or the other? If you know you're going to have this reveal around where the headlights go that are going to have to be blacked out and the headlights are going to have to be blacked out, why not just mask off the rest of it and shoot the whole thing on there? So I don't know all those answers, but I know that when it comes to the actual vinyl graphics, the reason they couldn't take a full vinyl graphic and wrap it and fill that area that needed to be painted that I had to paint is because you're never gonna get the side of that graphic to go up to the opening and roll down a quarter of an inch and actually stay there. Right now we're getting ready to fire up the Superbird. That means we gotta top off all the fluid levels, transmission, oil, uh, antifreeze. We're putting fuel in it. We just got a new uh, line of fuel here from Renegade. Gonna give it a try, it's 98 octane, so hopefully uh, the engine runs like it should back in 1970. Cars back in the 60s and 70s were made to run on a higher octane fuel. They had a higher compression ratio. The technology of the car's not as good at that point in time. The cars now, they detonate. They don't run as good on the lower octane fuel with the ethanol and stuff that's in the fuel now. I usually compensate as much as I can in the engine to make sure that it can handle today's fuels and still run well, but you can't, you know, you'd have to drop the engine down to eight and a half to one from the original 10 and a half to one to really get it to, to run the way they want it to on today's fuel. Uh, it's just easier to do an octane booster and a premium gas, I think. Fire and hole. Fire. You'll see these cars, when they first start them up on a lot of these car shows, they start them up and they run them, and the car's barely idling. You're not supposed to idle a car when it's first started. You're supposed to run it so long for that cam break in and whatnot. They don't want to show that it's out of time. They got the spark plug wires on wrong. It's not getting fuel or whatnot. We try to show really what goes on when you start an engine. Let's just double check the firing order to be sure. I just like to be sure, because if it backfires like hell and you blow something out of it, all because you were too lazy to double check the firing order, that's the wrong reason. When Mark got it started, it sounded really nice. I couldn't even hear it. I was in the other room. I couldn't hear it when it started. You know, I've had a lot of people comment over the years on uh, my dance moves out there. Frankly, to be honest, it wouldn't surprise me if Dancing with the Stars got hold of me and asked me to be on there. Um, I probably would accept, if that's, if that's what you're wondering, but would require to dance with Cheryl Burke. I think we'd probably be, you know. I'm sure you people have realized by now that Mark's not right in the head. And when he starts this crazy dance, when he thinks something has went well, for some reason his, his dancing ends up turning into boxing and he usually wants to box me for some reason. I have no idea why he does that, except he's not right in the head. It bursts out of me like Tourette's. Do you remember last time when uh, Mike Hill was here, you told him you were gonna be really good shape? Yeah. And I'm not in the greatest shape of my life. Okay, I, I could still knock a lung loose. Uh, I hit you so fast you don't see it coming, you see it coming back. That's all you see. And it's pretty bad he gets tired shadow boxing himself. When you're winding down the last few steps on these cars, there's always a lot of little detail. I would imagine that there was a department 
at the assembly plant that did all the fine tuning, all the making sure that the doors open and close the way they're supposed to, to make sure that the, the fit and the finish was right, uh, making sure that the hood pins were adjusted right and the gaskets were in place and if the, they didn't leak water and they didn't leak oil and all those little things. So that's just something we do. We just do it manually here. They may have had a whole system uh, implemented there because they were turning out you know, hundreds of cars a day. But that's just a natural part of finishing one of these cars, is having a, a punch list, going through it, making sure everything meets your standard, and moving on to the next step. When it comes to putting on the label kits, there's a range of places that these decals can go, like the VIN label on the door. You could probably take a photograph of 20 different Superbirds, and it ranges up and down it probably by inches. I mean, maybe in some cases, six inches. If you put it on in an area that as long as it is within the parameter of where it should be, then there's no really, there's nobody that can say it's wrong. It's just your, your photo would show that it's not in the right place. You still have the human error, the human element when these decals are put on the cars. They were, we're not all put on exactly the same because if this guy put on a little bit crooked, this guy put on crooked this way. I use photos. I call guys like Tony D'Agostino say, can you take a picture of your mission label underneath the hood so I can look at that? Um, to me, I think that the decals are the funnest part of the whole job. I mean, driving them and enjoying it and seeing all the waterworks from the owners when they come and they're balling all over the place and telling you you're the man is all fun. But to me, putting those last few decals on, the, the jacking instructions, the ethylene glycol warning label, the door vent, the emission decal, the stuff that goes up underneath the dash, hanging that little thing on the end of the turn signal, the, your starting instructions, or the sleeve that goes over the visor that tells you how to start it. All these things, I think, are the finishing touches, almost like that, that cherry on the top of the sundae that makes the whole entire package beautiful. Right now, we've got just a few more things left on it, not much at all. Like I say, uh, Derek has a little bit of paint touch-up to do under the hood. The main thing I want now is this car's completely drivable. It ran through the gears on the hoist. I'll just feel good if I can go around the block and back in it, make sure that everything's basically functioning. Then we can wrap it up in the morning and wait for my till to show up. like it's a brand new car, like the, the rusty car never existed, and here it's brand new and they just rolled it off the showroom floor. 10 days and 14 hours on the road, almost 4,000 miles. From rusted to resurrected, this 1970 Superbird has seen an amazing transformation. And now it's time for the Hills to lay eyes on their beloved 1970 Plymouth Superbird for the first time in two years, and the first time the car's ever been seen with paint on it in over three decades. Oh, I'm ready to see it. Yes, sir. Son, hold on. I've got to get a bathroom. long time. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Been a long Look time. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Oh, Great job, man. Great job. <laughs> nice, buddy. Huh? That is fantastic. I think that thing is going to look beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Man, I'm gonna Jen? tell you what. Oh, amazing. Beautiful. Nice. That's beautiful, Mark. I'm gonna tell you. A whole wow. Oh, good. Paint with hey, the way that's my... what we were hoping for. Mark, it is it is beyond my expectations. That's fantastic. It's, it's way beyond my expectations. Nice. 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 That's good. So what do you think, baby? Love it, baby. Mark, that is great. That Thank is you fantastic. So much. Let me tell you, buddy. I'm glad you're happy. You made with me it, a man. happy man. That's awesome. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. I see you sizing me up the whole time. <laughs> and and I think you actually have me in thickness, if that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair, Mike. Now. Hey. I told Mike that the next time I saw him that I would be in better shape than I was, and I think that I am. I don't know what he expected to see. Okay, he's back there in Shangri-La, South Carolina, living the life, you know. Let's see him come run a, a collision restoration business. Let's see him come over and run a television show. Let's see him handle 17 employees at the same time, all trying to, to poke the time clock, you know? Very good. Looking good, guys. That's great. Awesome. I really, really am glad that the car is so beautiful, and Mike loves it as much as I do. He's going to keep it forever, and his son will probably pass off to his children. And this, it just means a lot to me to know that the car will, will last forever, you know? And uh, the work that's been done on it, uh, it's just amazing what they've done. It's, uh, it was a total disaster when they brought it in here, and these guys made it look like brand new. And uh, 
I'm just really happy for him. Really, really happy. Yeah, you got it. Oh my. Mine too. I mean, <laughs> Holy <laughs> I gotta get a picture. I get one. To have the 2014 state figure champion of South Carolina set up on the on the spoiler just like they used to in the old days. You know, when, when Mike put Jen up on the Superbird wing, it reminded me of pictures from the old days where a lot of people would actually take their girlfriends and put them up on the wing. It was just a neat thing. It was just neat to see that. Yeah, home sweet home. It looks beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Mark, this is beautiful. I'm gonna tell you, Are buddy. Are you excited about driving it? I am <laughs> I am more than <laughs> I excited. I can tell by looking at you. Oh, ready. yeah. Nice. Well, the keys are in the ignition, my friend. Go for a little drive and tell us what you think. Come on, guys. Bring the whole family, Harry included. Let's get in this puppy and go for a ride. All right, guys. You ready? Ready. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you can turn on the radio, y'all hear me yodel. <laughs> Boy, muffles sound good, don't they? Oh, yeah. Yes, they do. It is nice. Keep it in a little gear so it sounds good. That's right. <laughs> what do you think, Michael? You like it? Yeah. You want one? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, she's running good. Okay or not? Always scary. How'd it oh, do? Oh, it did great, man. It did great. Good. It really did. Fantastic. What do you think, pal? Excited? Great. Yeah. It was truly a great moment here, and I'm not just saying that. To have Harry, the guy that bought the car brand new, show up and look the car over and give it his blessing. Well, I bought it back in late 1970. They were going for like $4,500, $4,600. I got it for $38. You couldn't get insurance on it, so nobody would finance it. They cashed. So anyway, I got that, and I drove it back and forth from South Carolina to Texas when I was in the Air Force. Put a lot of miles on it, and I went to Vietnam and sat for a couple of years. Came back, started going to college. My girlfriend was like 200 miles away. Back then, gas was like 29 cents a gallon. Uh, I still wasn't making much money, but still, you know, drove it, and I really enjoyed it. And then uh, probably around 76 or 7, I decided I was going to do stuff to it. Camshaft, intake, headers, and pretty much made the car undrivable, and that's when I pretty much parked it. I mean, I felt terrible the car looked so bad. I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people come up wanting to buy them, but people just bugged the heck out of it because everybody wanted to make a dollar off of it, you know? And so I just pushed it back in the woods. I knew about these cars since I was in high school. Uh, when I would drive by Harry's house, I could see the wings of these cars in the backyard or in his front yard. And as we came by, I always have loved these Superbirds. I finally uh, started working on a clone because I never thought I could be able to afford one. A friend of my old drag racing buddy of mine I hadn't seen for years told Mike you know, to come over and mention his name, so Mike did. And Mike was just a nice guy from right off the bat. You know, he wasn't acting like everybody else. My son and I took our parts around to Harry's house and showed him that we were working on a wing car. He says, hey, you know what? He says, come back and take a picture of the ones I've got. You can find out how your parts go on. My son and Harry struck off a good conversation. Uh, my son is very respectful, good straight-A student. He and Harry hit it off real well. They started talking about motocross riding. It was really good to see him and his son together. They, they had a great relationship. And I really didn't have a good relationship with my father when I was coming up. And uh, it just did something to me, you know, seeing him like that. Mike told me he would never sell them. He would always, you know, cherish them and drive them. And he would take better care of them than I did. When it was in the backyard, it was really, really rusty and falling apart. And, and I felt real bad about the condition I let the car fall down into. And seeing it like this, I'm just amazed at what they've done to it. You know, it's just, it's like it's a brand new car. Like the, the rusty car never existed, and here it's brand new, and they just rolled it off the showroom floor and they're, they're tricking me or something. I don't know. But it's just amazing. Two cars sitting side by side, and they're just like they did for years, sitting out in that field, sitting out in the air conditioned shop. I am 100% happy with the way Mark and his team handled this car. It is beyond what I expected. I never thought the car would turn out this well. I was almost afraid to drive it for what we've got here, but it's just so nice. But you know, I bought it and brought it to Mark to make a driver out of it. And we're getting to take it 3,000 miles as soon as we leave here. Yeah. You ready to take that first leg, buddy? Huh? <laughs>
So did it do good? Mark, did it, good? it did great. I am, I am ecstatic about that. It drove perfect. I love it. I, I can't wait. My, my hat's off to you. The whole team well, and this car coming together the way it has. Yeah, they did it. Made us happy. Very good. Darren, thank you. Oh, thank you, buddy. Make it too obvious. Yeah, thank you, man. First off, there is no perfect car when they're restored. I think the Superbird turned out very good. Did it turn out perfect? No. Were there flaws and imperfections? Yes. But overall, consider what that car came in here like, it turned out very, very, very good. Derek, right. nice to meet you, buddy. Thank you so much for uh, working the hard parts out on this car. The timeline that you had, you really, I know you pulled the midnight oil on this one. You burnt some midnight oil on this one, didn't you? More than one. I'm sure. I'm sure. Michael, you ready to hit the road? Yes, sir. We got seven to ten days to get home. I'm gonna let you take the first leg. All right. You know. Yeah, I'll see you uh, in seven to ten days. I love you. You be careful, All right, Harry. Harry. Yeah, man. You were the official. You were the official escort for my wife home. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Good to see you. All right, All right buddy. Later. Yes, sir. Y'all have a have a good flight. See you later. Clean it out. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Mark. You hard. Hard running really well. There you go. So where do you want to hit first? Well, I figure if we head down the California coast, we're going to know Oregon coastline. We're going to hit California. We're going to run the coastline down uh, right along the beach. Try to take in as many sights there. Maybe we can hit. You know, I've, I heard they do some sand dune riding out there. Yeah, that'd be and, fun. You know, I know how you like to ride motocross. Uh -huh. What do you think about doing that? Yeah, that'd be nice. Cool. To know that their journey with the car back home begins now, and knowing that it won't end there, that this is now going to be part of their lives for the rest of their lives and generations to come, pretty much solidifies when I say that I am the dream maker, that I am the Sandman, you know? Don't say, Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Say, Mr. Warman, bring me a dream. If you need me to duck down, if you see any really pretty girls and you need me to duck down. Uh, well, at least we got room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your tongue, boy. <laughs> I am 100% happy where I'm at. So Mike and Michael, I think it was uh, 10 days and 14 hours on the road, almost 4,000 miles. They drove that Superbird from Springfield, Oregon, all the way home to Sumpner, South Carolina. It's always nice to reveal the car to the owner. In the Superbird, there was a big buildup on this because they're actually going to drive the car back home, which put a lot of extra pressure on us. Yes, I was very happy when the car was revealed. I was very worried for the return drive home. Truly for me, and I think for anybody who's ever restored one of these cars or done a, a customer's car in general, the most rewarding thing in the world is to find out they're home <laughs> in one piece. I mean, they stopped in the Redwoods down in California. It's beautiful stuff. They went to the Santa Monica Pier. They, uh, they stopped at every tourist site, Grand Canyon, all the way back home. That's a trip of a lifetime between Mike and Mike, you know, dad, dad and son. It's something they'll probably never repeat in their lifetime. It's something that we, the rest of us are going to dream about. Next time on Graveyard Cars. Mark and the team check out a legendary Daytona. But will it be too far gone to save? Where's the rest of the car? The Cook's 1970 Barracuda is racing for the finish line. That ain't right. And Mark's original equipment loyalty is tested when the dailies want to install an aftermarket suspension from Magnum Force. In that, in that, in that, in that, in that these are effects? <laughs> you can't drive. She had to change all the suspension so you could drive this car. Is that it? Uh, no on the next episode of Graveyard Cars.